Welcome to Social Sessions. I'm genuinely very excited to have this guest on the show. She is a Grammy Award winning producer for her amazing work on the fabulous Defiant Ones and has been involved in countless television and film productions over the years. But all that aside, her most powerful piece of production was The Compassionate Prison Project, which she hosted with Gabber Matty. A powerful film about trauma, compassion and empathy. The film is an outstanding piece of work and the project still runs on helping countless lost souls reconnect with themselves and highlights the effects of trauma and its link to crime, addiction and mental health issues. The Compassion Circle brought me to tears when I watched it and I would advise anyone who has not seen the film to do so. Welcome, Fritzy Hotsman. So, hi Fritzy and welcome to Social Sessions. Um, it's great to have you. Um, and we're here to kind of talk about the Compassionate Prison Project that you do in America. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about um, how that came about, Fritzy? Absolutely. And Sean, it's so great to be here on this program. As you may know, I've been to Scotland and we've delivered our program to several prisons um, in Scotland. And so part of my uh, heart and awareness is now resides in Scotland. Uh, specific, specifically Glasgow and um, and Barlinny and Addywell and Edinburgh prisons. So uh, it's great to be here. And I, I plan to return next summer when I will be in, at the Trauma Summit in Belfast. So I'll just pop over and, and be great the idea, to see yeah, the idea is to do the Compassion Trauma Circle, which, um, which is on our website at CompassionPrisonProject.org where, where we step inside the circle for every traumatic event that we've experienced in our childhood. And so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, how Compassion Prison Project came to be. I, I was reading a book by Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score, which I highly recommend to everyone. And in that book, uh, I realized that my behavior was due to my childhood trauma and my adult trauma and had nothing to do with who I actually was. Um, but you know how we, we, we attribute characteristics and character and we, we decide who people are based on their behavior. And so, you know, I had been, I had been shame. I felt shamed, shame how I dealt with my, my sister, my son, my husband, you know, there was this like residual shame that was inside of me. And I just thought I was just some, something was wrong with me. And reading that book, it was just be, I learned it was because of my trauma. And it was such a, like a cathartic, thank God, like I'm not a bad person. I am just a traumatized person. And that information changed my life. And the, a month later, I walked into a prison I was volunteering just to see what was going on. I always worried about people in prison. I always thought this is, this is something is inherently wrong with this. I walked into a prison and what I saw were a hundred glorious men that were extremely traumatized who had made some serious, horrible mistakes in their lives. Um, but if we really break it down, their childhood was based on violence and they were programmed to violence from the, the first day. And so when violence becomes a solution and there are no other opportunities or solution, other solutions offered, what do we expect? You know, what you put in is what you get out. And so um, after that day, I cried all day, seeing what we had done, seeing um, what we had done as a society, we are all responsible for this. And um, there's a thing called 100% responsibility, 100% accountability. When we get to that level in our society, everything's going to change because we realize that we are responsible for everything, um, for the quality of our water, for, you know, the way we treat our incarcerated, our, our homeless, our impoverished. This is all on us. And this is all about all on us to, to solve. Um, so I, I vowed, I said, I have to do something. I, I've been working in the film industry since I was, you know, a young woman. And I was just like, Within a year, I quit my job and devoted myself full time to this this mission. And our mission right now, it says our mission is to create trauma informed prisons and communities. But you know, when you say trauma informed, it kind of, the, the brain kind of turns off trauma informed, blah 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 blah. So it's it's more to educate and 
inspire other people about their inherent value and their inherent goodness and to bring that out in all ways, whether it's a prison resident, a correctional officer, a staff member in a prison, someone who lives in a community, a child, a young man, a young woman. I mean, let's go. We, we, the amount of trauma that is displayed on a daily in the United States, in, in our world, is because we don't believe in our inherent worth. Trauma, trauma separates and community heals. So how's no, that for a few words? No, that is a great few words. And um, I don't think I could put it any better, Fritzy. Um, I think when you look at the, the conditioning um, that goes on in prisons, and that's including staff, um, you really need to look and see that there is a mentality of a di there's a division there. Um, and I've always said, without that trust between staff and between prisoner, you're never going to be able to heal. Um, and I think that's when the realisation of each other's trauma and each other being conditioned in a certain way by society allows us to heal. Um, so what kind of things have you been implementing Fritz, Fritzy and the, 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 the kind of prisons? What kind of things did you do uh, when you were in Berlin? Oh, well, the first thing I want to mention is the dynamics between the staff and the residents in, um, in Scotland and in the UK is very different than the dynamics in the United States. There's a much more, there's a much, uh, dr much more drastic us versus them in the United States and um, which creates even less safety. So I would, I would, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how the c comparison between violent incidents in, in the UK versus the violent incidents in the United States, but I would argue that they're, they're much higher and safety. Safety can only happen when people feel safe. So the only way we can create safety is if we decide that this is a safe environment. And what does that mean? It means we see people as human, um, we, which means we give them food that is, is worth, is, has some value to it. We, um, we have them dress in, in ways that, that show value instead of just these, these sh shirts that hang off of them. Um, I mean, they do that in, in, um, in, in, in Berlinia. Berlinia was, Berlinia was striking to me um, because they were all wearing nice polo shirts. I love that. Red and blue. And I don't remember what it was, but anyway, they were in different colors. But they, you know, they looked like, they looked like people that you'd see on the street and they were just all in the same colors. So um, what struck me about Berlinia though, and, and I hope the Scottish government doesn't take this wrong, but first of all, and I know they're building a new prison, but the, the, this is this is like Victorian hell, if you ask me. Just going into these these um, these units where they're, I mean, they smell they smell like permeated poop, and <laughs> I, you know, it's like this is not a humane situation for anybody, and how. How can someone, and now, then I find out, how can someone, you know, thrive and feel human when they're living in their own poop? Um, that's just one thing. But then I find that, the, you know, we, we came right around COVID during, like, just in the midst of COVID. And they were in their cells up to 23 hours a day. And the, here's the thing about this. And um, I know it's, it's protocol, but the thing about isolation is the brain the brain does not know how to deal with isolation. And so what we find are people that are, you know, they, they got into prison for being antisocial. So what is the, what is the antidote, antidote to being antisocial, which it's being pro-social, right? Which is being social, which is being socialized, being able to see another person as a human. And so by isolating them, we've, we've stripped them away of their, their possibility for empathy and connection. And this is this is the antidote to antisocial behavior is feeling connected to something, somebody, to a community, to a you know, to a cause, to something. And that's what causes crime. Crime is a, a result of, of crime is a result of mental illness because you don't feel 
you don't feel connected. You don't feel part of the society. You don't feel good about yourself, which to me is a mental illness. So, so Barlini, I mean, there was some incredible, incredible people there. Um, I remember one of the officers, he was, he drew me a few photo pictures on, on his PTSD sheet, uh, it's the sheet I, we gave out to all the officers to, so they could see the levels of PTSD that they have because being exposed to violence affects everybody. And the, the brain cannot distinguish if I hear about an event versus just see, seeing event or the event happening to me, the brain calibrates it as it's happening to itself. So when we watch a violent movie, when we hear about the news, you know, when we, like in, in, um, in the US, we're having a lot of like mob robberies right now, right? Which is just, which is, which is just a response to the dehumanization these people have. These people, I use that word, the people that feel impoverished, that people have, they're impoverished in spirit. I mean, that's the big deal. So Bardlini, incredible people, officers, administration working there, but the science needs to be applied here that isolation doesn't work. And it's easier, it's easier to maintain, it's easier to move people around, it's easier, you know, they go in, they say they go into these lovely, um, they have this lovely day room where they go in and play, uh, play pool and read books. But a lot of the people don't even want to go out because they're used to being isolated. The brain needs, and we've all were kind of used to being isolated during COVID. I'm still getting used to coming back and hanging out with people. So it should be forced integration. I mean, forced socialization, you know, um, and that's what I'm doing in prison. So I'll, I'll tell you more about that, but I'm sure I have another question. <laughs> um, no, it's just uh, very interesting, um, your take on Berlini, because when I was in Berlini, I was in the, the top end, so the conditions were different. We were we weren't isolated. We had a bit more freedom, um, but the power imbalance was so high. Um, it's, it's because it's all life sentence prisoners that are up there. Um, we 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 can uh, move on a. It's called an SEL, which means that it's, it's an escorted home leave. So that's your kind of big carrot to get people to move on and behave. So when I was 11 years into my sentence, I moved up there and it was great um, to have that kind of freedom. Um, and it was a bit of a kind of more rehabilitative um, setting. But the power imbalance and the success rate is so low, Fritzy, because the the... There's, there's just that much drug, drugs available. There's that much, as you say, violence. And it's all just things for escapism um, from a logical place. Like you're saying, it's a place that's really no built for purpose. But it's not, the, it's, it's not the prison's fault. The prison have been handed that and they need to work with it. So um, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be looking really forward to seeing HM, the new HMP Glasgow. But... Um, We'll see what happens, but so what would you say is the kind of main differences that you see then, Fritzy, from like America and when you were kind of over in Scotland, what was the kind of main differences? The big one, the big, big, big one was the the officers were concerned and invested in the well-being of the people that lived there. The, their there are officers I'm, I'm speaking, I'm working with a warden right now who I've been, he was an associate warden and he just got, he just got um, promoted to a warden and he cares about it. And I have to say he's much safer in, in any prison than um, some of those officers because he, the people know he cares about them. Um, that's the big difference. And um Walking into a prison in the UK, you don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I've heard about some prisons in, in England, so I can't, I can't really speak, but the prisons I've been to walking in those prisons, you don't lose your humanity. Um, I mean, you lose some of it, but you don't lose all of it. And that's, that's such a key piece of, of this transformation that I know is happening now. We're, we're on the, we're on the groundswell of this transformation. 
um, people think it's it's not happening, but I know it's happening. I, I see I see minds changing as as I go and as I do this work. Uh, I saw I saw the light flicker on one of the officers. We just started our our officer um, training, and I saw a light flicker on his face that that this is working. That it was we did an EFT tapping um, session, and he I think for the first time in a while he got to feel a rest in his body and so the body is when the body's in fight or flight it's in a different state right when you're in rest and digest like we are right now sean we're able to we'll be able to communicate and we're able to negotiate and we're in our cortex we're in a place we're in a place of possibility but we're in fight or flight we believe that the world is ending and that we have to do what we have to do to survive and um it's funny i i i you know but you know a boss a, an e um an email from a boss could put you into fight or flight right that could feel like a tiger is in the room and so or the tiger is is attacking you or you know you look at your checkbook and that feels like a tiger is attacking you so what we need to do as a society collectively is start clocking when we when we start going into this into this place um the other day my husband and i we've had this conversation about our son being on the phone uh for the past probably seven years and it always spirals into him him getting angry at me and me fighting with him and yes and it was two days ago for the first time i was able to say oh wait a second we're back in this he's criticizing me for my my idea and when I get criticized, there's the tiger. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna walk away right now because I don't feel safe. And, but that was a huge shift because now we're put con we've put consciousness cortex into the situation. Now we have a chance to start seeing each other as humans, even when we, when we start spiraling into, into our fight or flight response. Um, so I mean this is this is the key here this is this is when it all shifts when we're conscious of our thoughts and we're conscious of blaming somebody instead of taking responsibility for our part in whatever it is so it's it's catching every thought we have to we have to examine every thought the first book i ever read for it say that was the chimp paradox that was the first book that ever kind of changed my my view on things um, and it was about kind of catching your thoughts and stuff. Um, and then I progressed on to kind of, uh, I know you've spoke to him recently, Michael Singer, his The Untethered Soul. Um, I read that. Then I read Gabber Matty's um, In the Realm of the Hungry Ghost. So I started reading books that were raising my, my, my own consciousness whilst I was in prison. Um, but trying to, trying to share that awareness was hard because a lot of people are kind of ground down and beat down by that stage and they're not they're not really receptive to the advice that you're giving um and they maybe think that they go to they'll say you've changed sean you, you you've you've reverted like you've changed and it's as if in a bad way that i've changed whereas i'm saying not this is the way we need to go we need to get to a level of acceptance where we can accept staff for being traumatized as us. We, can, we see them as conditioned. We don't see them as the enemy. Um, but c coming out and saying that, it's there's so many people who have said to me, "I don't, I can't believe you're you're even given that kind of platform, Sean." And I'm saying, "I know, but we need to heal as a society, or it's or it's it's just broke. There's no point. The, 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 the prison system's never going to." reform anybody um so how would you how what kind of what would you do for it so you, to bring in and try and raise people's awareness that are in that kind of chaotic um life cycle that just they're really 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 away from the kind of any kind of consciousness any kind of higher level of consciousness they're nowhere near it how would you kind of try and adapt them and receiving a wee bit more of that. Okay, so lots of things to to say in all in that question. Um, the first thing um, I noticed when I when I when we flew over from United States to 
to Scotland, we had a stopover in, in, in Ireland. And I noticed when we were having lunch, the line for the bar was out the door and the line for the lunch, there was like four people in the line for the lunch. And I, and I saw women carrying bottles of, of wine to their table. And the men had, you know, three or four things of beer. And I said, what the heck's going on here? These people are drinking like, you know, like their life depended on it. And so everybody, that this was a social situation, but everybody was drinking about a bottle of wine in an airport. And um, I was like, what's going on? So I looked, I looked it up and this is in Ireland, but they said the, um, the alcoholism rate was at 70%. 70 to 80 percent and i thought whoa that's a lot of alcohol and so and i said that to some of the people when i was in scotland i shared this with them and they said yeah i'm sure that's the same in scotland and indeed you know i would you know you could just feel like people wanting to get to the pub wanting to get there and so we don't we don't look at drugs or alcohol as a violent act but it is, and that's the thing. It's becoming aware aware of the violence we're putting onto ourselves. So this is again catching our thoughts, catching why. I, like I'm addicted to coffee, and my son left his coffee. I'm I'm not drinking coffee this week, and I just was like, oh, I want that. I just I just walked by it, <laughs> and it, it's not as violent because it doesn't. It won't destroy my life, you know. It won't destroy my relationships. Um, like my father was an alcoholic and, you know, so my parents had to separate because they couldn't live with each other. And, but the, the whole thing is when you are addicted to something, you can't live with yourself. And so that's the thing because of all the violence and the belief in the violent things that we've been told, we don't understand our own inherent value, which is that we are miracles. We are all miracles. I say this to every time I walk into a prison. I say, have you ever looked at the inside of an eardrum? The intricacy of that, just the intricacy of an eardrum is evidence of how spectacular we are in this body, in this, in this life that we've been given here. And, you know, our parents couldn't see, I don't, I, I'm sure, I'm sh assuming you have, do you know how many aces you have, Sean? Oh, I would, I would have, I would, I know I would have a few. I don't actually have many. I, I wouldn't have as much from, from my childhood, um, in the regards that I had quite a good childhood. But I went into the prison system at nineteen um, mm -hmm. for fifteen years. What got you into the prison system, though? What, what in your mind decide, allowed you to decide it was okay to hurt somebody or, or do something harmful? Right, that's what it is. What was, um, so my case is kind of, um, I was actually in prison for something I didn't do, Fritzy, but oh, I was oh. still, um, I was still there when it happened. So that's a kind of controversial subject over here, um, my case in that way, but basically it was a fight that went wrong in a garden, um, and one of the boys that was with me stabbed one of the guys that had come up to get his girlfriend because he'd found out his girlfriend was uh, seeing one of my friends. So it was such a stupid, um, stupid fight that didn't need to happen, um, that ruined so many lives, mm -hmm. um, caused so much trauma across the board for so many people. Um, so I can't, I can't justify my actions on that night. But I, what, I can, what I can say is that I didn't commit the crime. I didn't actually do the okay. crime that I was in for. Right, right. But I was still there. Um, so there's a lot of legalities and stuff involved in my case for this. But um, I certainly, growing up in um, Scotland, we had a kind of gang mentality. Nothing like the US. Um, I'm talking about we kind of streets and stuff like that. But it was still enough where you, were, where, where you, you, you couldn't go into different areas. You couldn't go into this blah 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 so I probably started hitting aces maybe 13 14 stuff like that um and just growing up in Glasgow at that time was just a kind of uh, it was just just the way it was for it say so just everybody kind of hung about the streets and um there was a really bad knife culture at the time um so for me looking back 
um, at this, the stuff that I have been involved, that like even the stupid fights that I was involved in, I don't know where that that got. I, I think I think I think it led. If I can look back and as much as I can, I think it led back to when I was bullied when I was really young, um, and then when I fought back, I won a fight and the bullying stopped, and it. I kind of thought, I think for that, then on, I was kind of like, that's the way to deal with that. And um, it's a kind of Western culture in Glasgow as well. Eh? Like, go, go out and fight your, fight your battles. If you're if, if somebody's bullying you, you fight back. That's kind of the way it was. When, thankfully, it's a bit, it's changing a bit now. Um, so I, I don't really know, Fritzy. I, don't, I couldn't really answer that. But I would say probably 13, 14 was certainly when I started drinking hanging around in kind of gangs, if, 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 if nothing like the US, but if kind of like that kind of mentality. Yeah, so gangs are created uh, to, to, to have power, right? To, to get a sense of power, to also have a sense of superiority, us versus them, right? It, it, it locks in that sense that I have somebody that has got my back, I'm safe with these people. They're going to take care of me and we're going to be better than the guys across the street. So, and this happens, this is a, this is a root chakra. This is like the primal, this is primal for all of us is being in a tribe and wanting to feel safe with our tribe, you know? Um, and, but what happens is, so, and I want to get to the bullying also. So you, the bullying was violence perpetrated on you, which is not okay. Violence to anyone is you were dehumanized in that moment and you got to see what that felt like finally, not finally, but if you didn't have it from your parents, um, did your parents drink? Were they alcoholics or were they? No, I mean, <clears throat> drink was a big, big culture in Glasgow and I would, like for family parties, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always remember, um, like it was, it was just part of the society over here. Um, so there definitely was. My mum doesn't drink, and um, my dad likes to drink, but he certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't put him in alcoholic bracket, but he certainly would binge drink at a party, the same as myself. Yeah. Um, so. But not every day. Think, not not all the time. No, no. So, um. But going to like, I, I was a big Celtic fan growing up. So there was like the Celtic Rangers divide. Mm -hmm. So you would go to the old forum games to my granny's and like there would be maybe um, 30, 40 people um, all drinking, like heavily drinking. Um, and that was completely normal. Yes. That was like um, so normalized. And then at the end of the night, there would be arguments, there would be this, there would be, and it, this was all, all seen as normal when it's not, it's, it's abnormal. Well, um, it is normal if it, everybody's doing it right. And that's the other thing. Violence is normal. It seems normal for us to, in the United States, to beat our children, to, to demean our children. So violence being normalized, this is the thing we have to start looking at, which you're, you're actually calling out. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, not at all, Fritzy. Um, so no, that, to, to, it's just looking, trying to find where, because I can, I'm starting to see the the gangs thing go back in Scotland here. I'm starting to see the violence go up. The prisons, the people, my friends in jail, are telling me the violence is going up, and um, I'm blaming the the new types of drugs that are in the jails, the the, the kind of new benzodiazepines, the benazolam, and the kind of all that stuff, and the the spice, the the legal high stuff, um is really really ripped to the prison system to bits again um but just to look, looking at i just go how do i give i've got like cousins and stuff and i would say how do you know start getting in and we'll get you I could obviously try to link them into like different services and they just think that that's absolute crazy talk and they've never left they've never left their housing scheme but they just they, they they look at you as if you've just you've just asked them to I don't know do something absolutely terrible. But they, you go get yourself linked into a service, try and work on 
what you're what work on your kind of behaviors work and so much people are they're just so unaware and the level of awareness i think in the impoverished areas is really hard to to raise mm -hmm. but there is that I, I can see i can see i, I can see a, a good a good change in people like james docker and natalie people like that um that are championing that um so just to kind of bring you to my next question obviously gabber matt is a kind of big hero of mine and your compassionate prison project movie was absolutely amazing it had me in tears um it was absolutely me and my, my my partner my partner loved it as well what was it like um what my gabber he's incredible and he's um you know he's a bright light he's vulnerable about himself he's he talks about his own traumas um and he's so wise and he you know he doesn't excuse our behavior but he gives an understanding of why why we're like this and you know there's nothing there's nothing more valuable than to be seen and not judged and that's i think that's what he does all the time always so well and that he in, and we can see ourselves in him and he can see himself in us and that's that that access that access to ourselves through another person is all any of us ever really want and and so that's why he's so effective and so powerful working with him i you know i didn't really work with him on the film they just took my footage and put it in the film but he's been on my podcast twice i haven't met him in person yet i'm i'm looking forward to that day but um he's you know i i remember my when i was preparing for my first podcast with him i i was having a fight with my sister and like so i, I would go, have to go from fight flight back to my court you know i was going back in and out because she caught you know she can have some mental health issues um but it was like studying for an exam i felt like this was like the most important <laughs> interview I was ever going to have. And I, I treat most of my interviews like that, but this was, um, this was the big deal for me. And it still is a big deal for me having had that time with him. No, he's, he's, a, he's a special character. Um, and I'm going to, I'm actually going to see him on Saturday. Um, he's coming to Scotland on Saturday. So um, we're going to see him on Saturday. So obviously, hopefully get some Great insight as usual for Gabba. Um, so, so, are you planning to come? Are you kind of planning to? Natalie was on the show and she was talking about is it Homeboy? Yeah, Homeboy um, Industries. Yeah. Homeboy Industries. Um, and James was talking about Homeboy. Um, do you know anything about that, Fritzy? Does that fuse work with them? Or? Well, no, but it's interesting you mentioned that in. Uh... It's November, I believe. In November, we're going to be doing a circle with their their team. So brilliant. Yeah, and I haven't. It. I've never spoken with Father Boyle, but um, I've loved. I love the work that they're doing, and you know, the thing is, it's like anything we can do to bring humanity to ourselves and to each other, just to recognize our inherent value. Um, there's one thing we do. One thing I say when when we do our trauma to transformation workshop, which is a one day thing. I've done it here at, um, in Scotland, but it's, it's evolved in the past year. What we do is I, I raise my hand, I raise my hand and I can't really see it, but I raise my hand and it, it, my hand is in the form of a C, which stands for compassion. And when I raise my hand, it stands for divine human. And then I say, there are no subcategories. So we are not black or white. We are not rangers or celtics we are not um De democrats or republicans we are not officers or prisoners we are divine humans and there are no subcategories and just the thing to leave at the, by the end of the day i have said that so many times and raised my hand so many times i can just raise my hand and they all know and they all raise their hands and the power of that that they know even just for a day, even just for a moment, they are divine. They are perfection. There is, you know, look at that inner ear. I'm telling you, that's, that's evidence of just the eyeballs, just the eyeballs. 
I mean, all of this just the, and the brain, you know, the brain is the, is the, is the key here. It's what separates us from animals and it's our cortex that separates us from animals. And it's what we are capable of the most incredible divine acts in this world. And the people in prison are, and the people, you know, the people that are, that are homeless are. But I, I wanna get back to your prison thing. I just have some, a couple of things that I, I, I've observed in my, in my time working with people in prison is the crime, even though you were wrongly convicted, the thing about, and this is my spiritual thing. I, I believe we're all on a spiritual journey and I also believe we're all here to learn more for our souls. So it, it's no accident you got into prison and it's no accident you're doing this podcast. These are all divine things. You're, you're now putting a voice to your experiences, a voice to what you've seen and a voice to what you want to see happen in the world. So you wouldn't have, if you hadn't gone to prison, you wouldn't have that perspective. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be the man you are today. And that is true for everyone in prison. Um, and Byron Katie says, she says, I, I don't know the exact words. She says, you're in here so that you can bring this information that you've learned about your own growth back out to society. Because in society, nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Um, you know, every, every movie I see has everybody drinking a glass of wine at the end of the day. And it, what is that? What is the, how does that inform our society is that this is the solution to having to dealing with stress instead of breathing or getting a massage or going on a walk, you know, this is our solution and it's violent. It's violent to our bodies. I mean, I'll, I love a glass of champagne, you know, every once in a while, but not if it's going to take me out, not if it's going to have me have a headache every day or whatever it does or make me cranky. You know, I want to be on my game. I want to be, let's go, man. We got, I got things to do. Plus I want to live long. Um, but so, so to, um, to think of prison as anything but a growth, you know, a growth spurt, I think is to demean your life in its entirety. I'm not saying you, you have that thought. I'm just saying for all of us, even the people who have life without parole, this is what their soul needed to. I know a guy who was, who had two death row dates. He had, was about to, he was gonna be executed twice. They said, next week you're gonna be executed. So he had to live through that understanding that he was dying in a week. We could all die in a week, by the way. But he had to live with that visceral knowing that he, they're gonna kill him next week. And then they didn't. And now he's in a level two prison, still figuring out how to get home. But, but he, ha he has a knowledge in his soul that he never would have had. And, and I don't know th what the karma is. I don't know what all this, what this grand plan is, but I know I'm going to prison just, you know, I go to prisons all the time because this is part of my growth. And I grow more every time I walk in there. It is medicine. It is, it is seeing myself in, huh, in the glory and the magnificence of everyone who is, lives and works there. And until we can recognize that in, in ourselves, we, can, we won't be able to recognize it in them. And that's the problem. Um, you know, I'm gonna just go on this rant a little longer. Um, our former vice president Pence, he was doing, he was at the, um, the Republican debates last night and he talked about wanting to set up the death penalty so that anyone who was a mass murderer would be killed almost instantly. And the thing is, we're not in the prevention game, we're in the reaction game. We need to start preventing crimes and seeing the people that are, that are thinking suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts and helping them and, and ending child abuse. Um, you know, for your listeners, I'm gonna go through the 10 adverse childhood experiences and count as you listen, because, you know, a lot of this, I have eight of the 10. So a lot of this societal ills that we're dealing with, prison, alcoholism, drug abuse, um, domestic violence, this is all rooted in violence as a solution from our childhood. So here are the 10 ACEs. 
there's uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, having your parents not see you for who you are, not giving you the attention you need as a little boy or a little girl, um, emotional, uh, physical neglect, parents or caregiver ad addicted to drugs or alcohol, parents or caregiver mentally ill, suicidal or depressed, domestic violence, um, separation or divorce, and a household member going to prison. So I have eight of those. And so my behavior in the world what was, was and it still is uh, braced for violence. I don't, um, I don't trust the world. Even I, I choose, some of my friends are violent to me and it's, which I'm now learning about boundaries. I'm learning about, no, um, this isn't, isn't acceptable anymore. And that's the thing about people with trauma. We don't have boundaries because all of our boundaries have been, been destroyed. So how do we know what a, a, a proper boundary is? And so these are, these are tools that we have to, it's like we have to rebuild ourselves after what the trauma has done to us. And it's a, it's a long journey and I don't think it ever ends, but the algorithm is, the only algorithm is trauma separates and community heals. That's it. I think um, it's, it's just beautiful to see um, talking, Fritzy, to be honest, um, and your empathy and compassion and everything like that's just second to none. And I had a wee tear in my eyes were watering up when you were crying yourself there. Um, it just shows how much you actually care. Um, and I just, I, absolutely, it's beautiful. And I just would love to replicate that in society. But I don't know, I just don't think our society is ready for it at times. Uh -huh. um, I, there's, there's a change, but... I'm going to push back here because the thing is, so, so the, you know, Gandhi said, um, if you want to change the world, change yourself, right? So we can't look at what other people are doing and, and create a doomsday scenario because that creates a doomsday scenario. Um, when we say we're hopeless, well, then we're going to behave in that way. So it's up to us to change our thoughts and examine those thoughts because what you're seeing is just a reflection of, of thought. So we need today to, to create the future. Today we create the future. In this moment, we create a new world. So in this moment, I decided I'm not going to drink anymore, right? Let's just say that's what I've decided. That happened in this moment, and then that changes the rest of my life, right? So we are constantly, the, the, the next moment is constantly available to us. And in that moment, a whole shift can happen. It takes 66 days to change a habit, only 66 days. So two months and six days, you can be a whole nother person, right? You can be an entirely another person if you decide today that this is what you're going to do. And so I believe in what's possible. I believe in humanity and I believe in our inherent goodness and our and inherent worth. And I believe that in 66 days, we could have a whole nother world. So if we, if we decide today that it's hopeless, that's the future we have just created. So we have to really decide the world we want to create, but it's only within ourselves. The fact that I have worked out the thing with my husband and this, this phone thing, that changed the world because now I'm a little different and I'm able to explain it to people. And that's a little, everything's a little different now because I've done a little more work. And in that moment, two, two nights ago, I didn't fall into the trap, this trap that I've been in for the past seven years. So I changed and the world just changed. So we are more powerful than anybody has ever told us. And especially living in Scotland, Scotland is one of the worst places for self-esteem that I have ever seen, ever, bar none, categorically. They're just, they have been beaten. They have been, they're brave hearts. You guys are brave hearts, right? And you've been beaten down by the Protestants and the Catholics and the, and the this and the that and the, um, you know, the England and, you know, all that stuff. Uh-uh, that's not who you are. You are this glorious, this, you know, are you, are you all from Vikings? What are you? What's your roots? Do you know? 
I think we're a mix uh, quite a lot of things. I think Vikings, I think Vikings, French. Right, there's okay. Quite a lot in there. But let's go with the Vikings, right? Violence, right? Violence is a solution. Top, top drawer violence. You know, I want that. I'm going to take it. Um, so that's in your blood, right? That's in your DNA. That's in your survival system. You, that's how you know, you, you know, from centuries, literally centuries in your DNA that violence is a solution and we got to fight for our fight for it. And we feel so bad about it. We have to drink about it. Right. So those are the, that's the paradigm over there. But also Vikings are glorious, right? They're the, they're the brave hearts, but it's not fighting anymore. It's advocating and it's, it's realizing and seeing each other as humans. That's the, that's the shift that we're going into, but also recognizing the glory of, of this entire species that you, you are, you know, you're, you know, I got English and Irish in me, so I'm part Viking too. Um, so I get it, but the violence thing, it doesn't work because what it does is it destroys, it just destroys um, the officers from Nazi Germany, the amount of domestic violence and alcoholism and, you know, destruction in the, and aces that was perpetrated from those acts, those acts that they did, they had to hold that, right? But as a society, we're holding that too. So we're not immune to it. You know, the U.S. stood by for, for years, right? Or whatever. Who's ever culpable? We're all part of this. And we are one organism. We are one cell in the universe. One little earth, other earth is our one little cell. And how we decide it to be starts with the decision we make in this moment. No, I agree with you, Fritzy. Um, me personally, I'm spiritual in the way that I don't know. I'm probably agnostic. I'm not sure. I just believe in a higher power. I believe um, in positive energy and good energy. I kind of read into Tesla and stuff like that. Um, so my views are kind of on the spiritual level. I'm very spiritual. But when I when I see other people in prison, um, when they're beat down with drugs, and I've been there, I've been in that position when I lost my appeal, um, and I was beat down so much that my partner thought she was never going to get me back. She thought that that was it. It was like... You were, I was so broken that I was never going to come back for it. Um, and on it, to be honest, when I first got out, I didn't take life serious for two years. And then I started making, doing wee things and looking at projects. And then obviously we started looking at the podcast and I was like, look, I could, I could go down the crime route and get like people on to glamorize crime and all that. And that's just so not what I wanted. Like, I want to change. I want to make a positive change in the world. Um, so that's where that my kind of journey started with this. So I'm still working on myself. I've still got an awful lot of acceptance to do. And I spoke to you about that before when we first spoke. I've accept, I'm trying my hardest to accept um, that the reality of the situation is the reality of the situation. And I can't change that I might never win my appeal or I might never get another shot at my appeal. But working with miscarriage or justice victims has mm. also gave me an insight to, to how much I have actually moved on because some of these guys are the most broken guys I've ever seen. Um, even guys who've won their appeal, um, it's just that... They cannot get out the, the mindset, the mind frame or anything of the system. They, and they need to get something. They need to get back at the system. And when I first went in and I, I mentioned the word acceptance in, in the Miscarriage of Justice Organization, there was, a, there was quite a lot of um, backlash to it. There was a lot of kind of people saying, like, how dare you? Can I? How can I accept? And I get that. I get why they would say that because I've been there. But I was saying it for a personal view and going, look, we'll never move on. We won't move on if we don't accept it. Um, and so the group work that we were doing in the miscarriage justice victim uh, organisation, I started to see people changing, 
starting to see people's outlooks changing. And it was only through me and Scott, another guy, a great worker who works with Miscarriage of Justice, we were doing group sessions and um, I could, we could see the change. But out of like, I, th I would say, I think there's like 40, 49, 40, 40 odd clients on the books at, Miscar at Mojo and like six come to the groups. The rest are just totally disassociated with, with life. And I think um, trying to, it's so hard. I just try, I try and go, how do you explain to these people you need to raise your vibration <laughs> and your consciousness? It, it's so hard to kind of explain to a person who doesn't know what that really means for it, safe, if, if you get me. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things here. First of all, um, raising their vibration. We'll get back to that. I'm going to write it down. Let, remind me about raising your vibration, but I want to talk about you still seem to be carrying this resentment for being incarcerated wrongly. Is that, am I, is that correct? Is that what I'm gathering here? Uh, there's there's def, definitely still some there. Yeah. Well, in this moment, what I'm suggesting to you is that you let this go because you are now, you're walking around the world as a victim as look what they've True. done to me instead of, True. I am Sean, I am powerful, I am I am making sure this doesn't happen again, but that is in the past and you are bringing the past into this moment. What kind of new world can you create if you're bringing the past into it? You can't True. because you're just you're just a victim and you are not you've lost your sense of agency and your sense of gratitude, right? Those are the two things that that people that have mental health just um, uh, show. So today, forgive them. They know we're not what they do, right? Let it go. Sure. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's going to take me a long time to forgive. It's like, no, you can forgive in the moment. Um, that's the that's the definition of a miracle, which is a shift in perception from fear to love. Tell you what happens for it. See, see um, I could tell you just now, and I, I promise you, I mean it with a way on my son's life. I mean that I forgive everybody, and and I do mean that. Something can then happen that will pull me back to that resentment. Yeah. So I know that I'm working on it, and I know that I'm getting to a, I'm getting there. Yeah, you're working on it. That's just do it. Yes, that something will happen to pull you back. That's called a thought. That's a thought you examine the thought, say, oh, yeah, that's from the past. Thanks for showing up, moving on. No, no, no. You have no. to be r rigorous with yourself and, and not, you know, not be triggered by all. I mean, you can be. I mean, and we are until we are. We are until we are. Right. We are. But the thing is, you have to be really a conscious now because this modality of becoming a victim is keeping everybody watching Netflix doing nothing. And, and mm -hmm. we, we need to get everybody out of their chairs, realizing their value and moving and getting into, getting into a community and getting things done. So you can say I'm working on it, but I just call baloney. You either are, you're either, <laughs> you're either doing it or you're wallowing in your sorrow and, you know, just get on with it, you know, um, so here's here's another this that was from the course of it shift in perception from fear to love is a course in miracles this is also from the course in miracles and she says and well she says because it's marianne williams and and uh, <laughs> i've been listening to her do, talk every day god doesn't need to forgive you because god knows you're innocent and same with all the other people that harmed you forgiveness is for you so you can recognize you're, you can remember and recognize your own innocence. And I'm going to say one more thing. And this is, you know, when you talk about the people that are in the mire, um, the Buddhists talk about three poisons. There's greed, there's hate, and there's ignorance. So we, we, um, we cure greed with compassion. We cure hate with love. And we cure ignorance with wisdom. But the root of the word ignorance is to ignore. 
So what about yourself? And I say these, this, I say to all the people in prison, what about yourself? Have you been ignoring? Because that's, that's where we're living in. We're living, we're ignoring our, our perfection, our ability to transcend these little, these little events, prison, how many years in prison? 11, how many years? 15. 15 years. These little events that happened to you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to, <laughs> no. to make light no, of it. No, I know, I know, I know. No, I know at all. But I, know that's, you, I know it's coming to a good place, let's see. Those 15 years where your soul really got to understand, understand um, despair, got to understand violence, got to understand, you know, the inability to transform their lives. Well, that's also being a victim, right? So you actually learned how to be a victim too. So definitely. So this is this is we are no longer victims in this moment. We make this decision and we move forward. Otherwise, we can just you know we'll just live the same life that we've been living. But I want to I want a glorious, refreshing, exciting, dynamic life for myself, for my child, for my husband. For everyone I live in prison, I work with in prison, that lives and works in prison, and for you, you know, I want that for you. I want because when you're in better shape, the whole world's in better shape, and that you can just know that when you go into a coffee shop and you say, "Good morning, good morning, Larisha, how are you?" She's suddenly in a better place, right? So it, we know the effects of our energy into the world, and you know they talk about the quantum field, every negative thought changes the field, but every positive thought changes the field. Definitely. So how many positive thoughts can we put in Scotland? Let's get this going. You know, let's Definitely. stop with our self despair and our self, our self abuse, because we were taught that. And it's, it's bullwhack. It's not true. No, I think um, when I was in prison, I get taught quite rightly so from the older guys. Um, this is the best mindset to, to create. And uh, I did create it for a long time. And the mindset is a terrible mindset, but it's a, it's a survival mindset. It's a, so what you, what you used to say, the, the, the saying was, hope, think of the worst and hope for the best. So every single outcome, you would think of the worst possible outcome. So, and anything else was a bonus. So, Anything, you would never expect anything. And that was the whole mindset of the prison system. So it took me till I read like the power of now, um, just different things. I, I, and I was like, man, I need to change this mindset. Like, I, I, this is really no working. And you're so right. I was, I, and I'm still, I'm still capable of going into victimhood and, um, and the right kind of scenarios and if things are getting said, I can go revert back to that. I try my hardest not to, um, and I, I feel as if I'm getting better all the time and, and stuff at catching my thoughts. I'm still doing that inner work on myself, um, but it's stuff that I would love to take in. And, and, and when I went to uh, Lomos prison, I asked Lomos prison, I said, look, can you get me four staff and four prisoners and we'll do a course together? I says, and we'll do it on kind of trauma and we'll do it on kind of work the class route. Like we're all working class. We come for this, we all come from the same areas. We like the same things. We'll get the same hobbies, football, whatever, if it's even going for a pint, whatever, um, to show that we're all the same, to show to stop this kind of miss this lack of trust. If an, if an officer says to me, Sean, are you taking drugs today? Even if I had been, I would have said no, because you're only going to get punished for it. Right. So if you punish, try and punish trauma and addiction out of somebody, it's just going to, it's just going to make them worse. Yeah. Um, so there needs to be a, a massive shift in the prison system. And I totally understand their position where they're in a, they're, they've, they've got, they work by legislation, they've got policies, they've got regulations, they've got so much that they need to work by. Um, but no, I never heard back from Fritzy after. I asked them if they could, and they just said, I don't think that'll work. Yeah, well, um, keep knocking on the doors. That's what I've been doing. 
I know, I know. No. I might keep doing that, say them again. Um, obviously, this podcast is, quite, is ha- hopefully catching a bit of traction. And obviously, we had James Dockery on it. Natalie's on Sunday. Um, it's great to have yourself on it. Um, so it's all positive messages that we're getting out. Um, and obviously, it's all about opinions. And there's a lot of people, um, like what a good friend of mine, Stuart, who I was in prison with, who was really quite, actually quite a tough prisoner, um, was always in fighting, was kind of stuck up for his cell, had, like had a reputation, you wouldn't mess with him, kind of thing. He's training to be a priest now, um, and it's a wonderful story. Um, and just the people that I see that do make it on the other side are the people who start to look at their own thoughts, start to see the, the making conscious decisions, that's where you see the change. Um, but I just don't think that the prisons are equipped to deal with. Uh-uh. We can't. We can't do that. We can't blame the prisons. We can't. We have to take responsibility for everything that's going on. Hundred percent responsibility. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to transform. The minute you say this True. is my job, the whole thing changes. Because we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're waiting for somebody else to come rescue the whole situation. I know that's not happening. Status quo is very, everybody's very happy the way things are. So that, so I'm just saying, no, 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 no. I'm knocking on the doors. I'm saying, no, no. Uh, people in prison are traumatized. They need to know about that. Um, we did our trauma talks class. We have this um, 16 week curriculum we created. 80% of the people in prison Taking this class didn't know they were traumatized. Eighty percent. So, wow. So imagine the day they're told, "Oh no, no, your behavior is because of your trauma. It's not who you are. It's like, it's like a gift from Mother Mary or whoever you know who how <laughs> you know Santa Claus on on on. It's <laughs> on Christmas Day. Yes, it's the best thing. It was the best news I ever got in my life, and um, so I'm just basically just spreading the news, you know. So. When we, when are we going to see you? I know you've got your own podcast, Fritzy. Um, so how's that been going? I know I watched you and Michael sing it. It was great. Um, so how's that been going? Well, to be honest, I took the last nine months, I stopped all other activity and I've been working on visiting prisons and finishing the curriculum. And as of the end of today, the curriculum will be complete, at least the first pass. Right. So, um, you know, things are going to, evolve you know things we get you know i started creating this curriculum uh, two years ago so now i want to go back and watch all the things and say oh yeah i know more now like i know so much more like paul conti do you know him he's incredible um he's there's a really an amazing four-part series with andrew huberman and paul conti um and i highly recommend no andrew huberman. yeah he, he did a four-part series with with conti and that's where i got the thing about um agency and gratitude was from him. Um, so yeah, I want to add Paul Conti to my, all my, my content. Um, but we're, we are, we're, we're going to start launching the podcast probably this in December or January, Pro- January sounds better, but I'll start recording maybe in, in, in November. But now that I have, it's like, I, it's like I have this open door of, of possibility of more things to create. Um, one of the things we have that's going on and which I really want for Scotland is all of our podcasts are available to all of the people in prison. And so yeah. even though they don't have our curriculum, they're learning about trauma through our discussions. And so it's, it's a lot of people are getting great value just from hearing these podcasts and just more content. I want more content in prisons. Like I'm, I'm, I want, some of our um, curriculum has TED Talks in it and they want to charge us a lot of money. And I'm like, dude, you know, any any free person can just click on, a, on on the link. I could just send them a link. I can't send links <laughs> to people in prison. Give it to us for free no. because these guys need it more than anybody else. And so mm-hmm. hopefully they'll say yes. Otherwise, please send in $5 so we can pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, and I think they've tried things like this before when they're, um, they're, they're, they've got the prison radio in Berlin mm. um, and I think they sometimes get speakers and stuff and Natalie obviously works 
tremendously hard in the background with all that kind of stuff. She's um, really, really amazing at what she does, but it's the the stepping stones, you're so right, it's trying to get that as much information as we can spell out so that every single person can understand their own trauma, mm -hmm. um, whether it be through a spiritual way, whether it be through just like maybe like Eckhart Tolle, like a, like yeah. a power now moment. Um, there's different ways of approaching yes. um, trauma. So, and it's no one shoe size fits all. So I think it's an amazing thing to get as many guests on and hopefully one will click with somebody. And if it clicks, then that's when the, 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 the paradigm, as you say, that's the shift yes. beginning. Yes. Yeah. Um, so no, that's an amazing, it's, it's a great project. Um, so is there anything else, Fritzy, that you're kind of, you've got in the pipeline or is, is obviously you've, you've got, you've got loads on that, that you've been talking about, but is there anything else that you would kind of like to highlight? Well, there's a couple things. One of the things that we do with the officers is that instead of adverse childhood experiences in the circle, we do adverse prison experiences in the circle. So I'll read the question. If you've ever seen or been assaulted by a prison resident officer or supervisor step inside the circle, you know, so we have assaults, we have being gas, which is having urine or feces thrown on you. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, so they're taking steps and we did it three times um, last week in Washington state. And, you know, everybody was walking in, everybody, the amount of trauma that the people that work in prisons. And then I did the same questions with the residents and most of the people walked in. So here's the thing is we're continuing the cycle of trauma, the idea that violence is a solution. You know, violence, once we, once we decide that it's not a solution, it has to be a decision. It has to be a decision. And it, but if you decide today and I decide today, that's two people. And then we, we let other people know what we, what we understand about this idea. And the listeners, maybe everyone listening today will decide that no, violence is not a solution. I'm going, but see, it's just also violence to self or violence to others, you know, just for me sitting here blaming somebody for something that they did that I didn't like, I've lost the ability to, to have agency and take responsibility for myself. I'm putting it back on them. Like they look what they did to me. I'm back in the victim mode. Mm -hmm. We got to end this victim thing. Victims are alcoholics. <laughs> Victims mm -hmm. are drug addicts. Truth. Yes, because mm -hmm. they've lost their sense of who they are. And when we re re return to that idea of the glory of who we are, there is no more addicts. There are no more. There are no more. There is no more violence. It's just a new world. And that's what we're bringing in, Sean. And every time, every time you love somebody or remind them how great they are, that changes. Even if it's just a look, just a look. And it's, we just got to keep reminding each other who we are. And that, I believe that's one of the ways. The other thing I have that's going on is, um, you know, we're doing these tablets. I want to do a, a film festival. So having all the films about prison that are helpful, like um, The Wisdom of Trauma. Um, there's one called Prison Terminal, which is about um, prison prison residents working with the hospice, the dying residents, just getting these films into the prisons so that they, they can see themselves and they can see what's possible. That's, that's what I'm doing. I want them to really understand how great they are. <laughs> no, you're doing it, man. You're doing it. <laughs> you're doing it. Because um, they are, they are just, just because you make a really bad mistake. I mean, just because you've killed somebody doesn't take away your humanity. I mean, you took away that person's life and their humanity, but we can recover your humanity. We can recover it and you can, you can change the world even from a prison cell. I believe it. No, definitely. I believe that as well. And I've seen, I've seen it in my own eyes. I've seen, um, whether it's people going to the prison fellowship, um, whether it's me, like me personally, I've gave, I've passed on books like, um, the, the untethered soul and uh, gab a couple of gabbers about the myth of normal and stuff, and um, it, you do see changes in people, um, and you can. It's just trying to keep kind of chipping away at 
that and trying to make them see that they are actually, that, that as you say, they're a divine human being that's been put here on the planet um, for for good. But some of these guys have just really hard to break down. I, I've seen a really hard to break down. Um, but I suppose it's just people like yourself, Ritzy, and even people like myself, like even on a, it's not, it's on a smaller scale, it's it's still trying to put the message out and trying to get the 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 kind of the message out that, that that we need to change as a society and need to to heal. But it's uh, let's see the, the reason why I do this trauma thing, why I'm so focused on the trauma, is because this is the reason they feel like this. This is why the, they don't love themselves is because of their trauma. Once they realize that it, this is the key, this is the key to, to at least for most, I believe, because. I walk into a prison, I have, I work with a hundred men. And by the end of that day, I ask how many people, it's called trauma to transformation. How many people here have experienced some kind of transformation? Every hand goes up because the, a lot of people didn't know they were traumatized. A lot of people didn't know that they could talk to the, the person who lives two cells down that, you know, they're so isolated. And so, you know, they're so boxed in into their own own limitations that they can't enter their past, which they're carrying with them. They can't even see, they can't even see the world clearly or what's possible. And so just to turn some lights on, you know, to me, that's why this trauma awareness is like, it's, it's the key to ch changing our society. It's like the first step. I think it's the first step because once we realize that, that Pence, that, that, the former vice president is traumatized because he wants to continue to kill people um, who do wrong things. And so he can feel justified and, and better about himself. This is all about feeling better about yourself through violence, right? Through violence. No, let's feel better about ourselves through love. That's it. I feel better about myself every day. The more I, I get in touch with my own dysfunction and the more I get in touch with my own love and my own, what, what I give back and, and the repair, right? So we're all traumatizing each other, right? But if we can start repairing, you know, we like, you know, I'll say a slight to my husband and I, you know, I walk the dog and I'm feeling like crap having said it. I go right back home and say, I'm sorry, honey. I don't have to be right. I just have to be, I just have to just repair it so we can get back on with loving each other. You know, let's just repair it. Who cares who's right? You know, I mean, how many people are fighting for 10 years because, you know, you don't do the dishes. It's just like, get off of it. Just repair it. <laughs> repair this. We have to repair this and move on so we can love each other. Um, I think a, um, a wonderful kind of, like, um, a wonderful kind of um, thing that you can see is, 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 I don't know if you watch nature, Fritzy, but there's the, you've got the chimpanzees, and then you've got the subspecies, the bonobos, mm -hmm. um, and the bonobos work with love and like compassion. They never, they don't fight. They don't. It's it's such a, and it's basically because they've got no predators around about them. There's no um, danger, so they were kind of. I don't know how it happened, but they basically get put on a wee island. So the bonobos don't have any aggression they don't they're, they're totally like lovable and the exact same species but obviously chimpanzees live in a an environment where it's rough and mm -hmm. it's like there's a lot of predators they need to watch they're young so the difference is there you see that they're in fight or flight mode constantly as well as animals um and the society we have built seems to be putting us on to fight or flight whether it be you need money for the mortgage. You need money. You yeah. need. To, oh, you're, you're worried about the kids. You, you're constantly in this, like fl flight or flight mo mode, where you you're all piped up and full of adrenaline and cortisol and stuff that sh we should we, we we never get a break right. from right. that hyper that kind of hyper sense of state until we drink right until that so that's why we drink until we drink right. or take drugs right, right. so. That's the thing to be aware of, to be aware of, oh, I'm getting into this. Like you have a quarter of a second to realize when you're starting, when you're starting to go. And as you start, the more you get aware of it, the less, the less we're in a bottom up situation. We're more in a top down situation that we're, we are be, we're able to control our bodies and our reflexes and our reactions. And like I did with my husband, 
saying, you know what, I'm going to leave here because I'm not in, this is not, this is not going anywhere. And, and it, but it's, and there you go. You get evidence, you get evidence of healing right. There's another little, Oh, I did it. I'm healing again. And, you know, creating boundaries. That's it. You know, we, so the, you know, the things, you know, we want to have that drink. I want to have that coffee. I want to not feel, I want to work and just, but the real work is to sit in the feelings. And that's the hard part. We have all these feelings that we haven't processed. You need to kind of meet the, you need to meet the trauma head on and, and, and feel it as a, it is only a feeling and it is only an emotion. And it's trying to, exp, trying to explain that to somebody. Um, it's head on in little when, bits though. Cause we can't, you I, can't, you can't like, you can't, and you won't. You know, you, we, we are lazy creatures. We won't do it. But if you can take a day and just, you know, mourn your mother or take a day and mourn the 15 years that you spent in prison, you know, just mourn that, feel that, feel mm -hmm. whatever those feelings are. Um, they're not comfortable. They're really, they're not comfortable. They're awful. And I, I did it no, recently. I, I'm, I was mourning something and, and it was really, um, I understood why I wanted to go get up and just I, I i'm not anything but this but it's getting into that getting into the feeling of who we are as humans this is all this is the whole spectrum of being a human and, and we have narrowed it down to fight or flight and drink and um you know and and no, righteousness definitely. being right about ourselves because you know we we don't feel good about ourselves so we we want to be right and it's a society that's um, there's ego is huge. Like ego has got a huge part to play. I think you need, that was a thing I had to drop quite. I had any, when you first come out of prison, you've got that ego where um, you, you had to kind of have that to survive mm -hmm. in prison. You had to have an ego to some extent. And I didn't get through prison because I was a hard man by any means. I got through prison just by being myself and having a kind of, kind of nice good personality and helping people and and whatever um but there <laughs> certainly was aspects of when i was in obviously you're in that long you're in positions where you know that serious violence can occur at any time around the corner um and you're in you're in that st st people that you're maybe sitting with can people come into the hall and so you're you're totally living in a hyper vigilant state and you're so unaware of it and some of these guys have been living in this hyper vigilant state as you say for they were like two and three year old maybe even maybe if, if, if gabber matt is right and i think he is in the womb it's before that it's actually prenatal you know what i mean yeah. so um it's 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 so um i think it is it's you just need to drop your ego and kind of try and move try and as you say the, the things the hardest things that you've got in your life when you when you look deep inside yourself you really need to challenge and try and kind of work work through it um to the best of your ability and uh, as you say is and, and, and it takes time why does it have to take time well yeah it does take time but sad sad guru say sad guru um actually when i read his book i read his book he says the same as you it doesn't need to take time like you can do it overnight you can um i don't think that's no that happens for the most of the population but I, I think it's possible we are powerful that's the thing and we can change the world in an instant that's it so it's oh i agree with you yeah that's so that's what sad guru is saying is we can heal we can heal everything we can we're you know and you know we can get total clarity and total brilliance in a moment definitely so and and it is giving the people in prison this information but demonstrating it so that they can see it you know with the hand up definitely i think there's some countries that make and whilst in prison i don't know if it's thailand vietnam and things but i'm pretty sure they make um meditation and stuff like that and uh yoga and stuff i think they make that mandatory so that the guys need to do that 
I think yeah, if you can make it mandatory, yeah. um, if you can make it mandatory to go to a shed where it's pointless, where you're doing nothing, you could make it mandatory, even if people go a few times and don't listen. See, it, well, the penny will drop eventually. So if you made it mandatory, maybe an hour a day, one hour a day in the prison, look, a bit of yoga, a bit of meditation, time for yourself. And groups. And it's mandatory. We're adding and in groups because you got to get the the pro-social activity going too. Yeah. Definitely. I like the um, yoga, man, the mandatory yoga. Or voluntold, voluntold. <laughs> but that's a voluntold. <laughs> um, but no, I think a lot of these guys end up coming out that spend a lot of time and going on to be kind of monks and stuff like that. Um, because that's they've, they've lived that life and um, it's just amazing to watch I've watched a few programs on it and that's a few different YouTube things um, so just as we're coming up to the end Fritzy it's been absolutely amazing having you honestly um, it's been so so good and um, if you could just if you can give, give a wee message for it for the people in Scotland that are going to watch this that suffer from trauma suffer from anxiety if you, you could give them a wee message um, that you could maybe get them into the kind of what, we what we've been talking about, what would you say to them? Okay, so first thing I wanted to say before I go into the message um, is I want to also say that the monks, you know, how monks live, they have to wake up at like three in the morning and they have to do all these chores and they have to beg for their food, these at least Tibetan monks. And so the life of people in prison and the life of the monks is not that much different. Plus they each have a lot of time to think about what the hell is going on. And that is one of the reasons I feel that the people in prison are the key to our, to our paradigm shift, that they are the ones who have the time to think and can. Now, I don't know if you, you've been in prison, so you know that they're all MacGyvers in there. They can take like mm -hmm. uh, they can take like a tissue and a little bit of cardboard and make a purse. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they they are thinking in ways that we they their brains are are primed for the the shift. And you know, Einstein said you can't you can't expect different results with the same minds that created them. Well, these are the minds that we need on this problem. So. I just wanted to add that, you know, these are the monks. These are the people that, that I believe have the possibility to transform the world. That's what I tell them. And, and if you think about it, it's the truth. It's the key here because they've seen the worst. They've seen, they are in a hell realm that the Buddhists call this a hell realm. And so within this hell realm, when they can rise above it, you know, it's it's game on. And so I know the people in prison, if, if they ever get to hear this, it's game on. So um, for the people in Scotland who are listening to this, I just want to um, help you remember and stop ignoring your divinity here and your limitlessness. And I know you Maybe there's a problem, maybe you can't pay the rent. Maybe there's just unimaginable problems that I have no idea about. Yes, I get it. And I've, I've been through some of them too. And I watched my parents suffer through these, these unimaginable problems. But they come from a, a place of not remembering who you are. And I, I don't know how, to, how we get to that place, but find out about your trauma learn about it, become a trauma detective, as I like to tell people. Um, find out why your mother, why you didn't feel safe with your mother and that you couldn't attach to her and what attachment disorders are. Find out about developmental trauma when you're not getting the attention you need as a little perfect young boy. And what that did to your ability to empathize with people and your ability to have a, a decent relationship. All these things are from trauma. And when we start understanding how we're built, we can re we can rewire this whole thing, this whole mechanism, and remember what we have to start with are these eardrums that are miracles and eyeballs and this whole this whole organism. And from that place, everything is possible. 
And we need all of you. Scotland is one of the places I believe it's similar to prison that when Scotland gets it, the whole, the whole, the whole will get it because um, Scotland is holding a lot of thoughts of self-worth of low self-esteem and low self-worth and um, putting self down and not, not recognizing the glory that you are. Um, one of the women I work with in Scotland, she said her mom would go with her to these events and she'd see the mom just clapping. She didn't the mom, like, I'm like this with my son, like, yes, this is my son. <laughs> and, and she was sitting there clapping with like little hands. The mother was, it's like, no, 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 no. And, and no, we have to celebrate each other and celebrate each other's wins. My win does not mean you're not going to win. And and to get out of this muck of, of self-abuse and societal abuse of each other. And, oh, yeah, you, no, 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 I'm, no, everything's fine. No, it's okay. No, let's go, man. Let's go, Scotland. Um, I'll be there in, in next year. Let's get a circle with the Rangers and the Celtics in a circle, stepping to the cir inside the circle with our childhood trauma so we can see how really unified Scotland is. I'll try my I'll try my hardest on that one. Uh, you're going to try or are you going to do this? So see if you when you try, I'll do yeah, this there for you. you go. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. I'll get it yes, done. Yes, let's get it done because this will be a moment in time when everybody realizes how connected and what's possible we are. No, brilliant. Thank you, Fritzy. Honestly, Fritzy Hortzman, um, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Sean. You are um, you're a strong game changer. You're a strong game changer, and I'm expecting the best from you.